So for over 25 years, I've been interested in understanding how people communicate and present themselves when communicating with others when online. Are they willing to present their true selves, who they really are, their true beliefs and opinions, regardless of how popular or unpopular these beliefs and opinions may be? Or are they going to present an ideal version of themselves? a version of themselves that they think will be likable, acceptable, popular. Scholars initially predicted that online communication would free people to be their true selves, regardless of how unpopular it would be. So tonight I'm going to talk about whether or not online communication really gives us that freedom. Or does it not? And if not, why not? But first, I'd like you to go back uh, 30 years with me to 1993. And it was back at a time when none of us had even heard of social media. And in July of 1993, there was a cartoon published in The New Yorker by Peter Steiner. And in this cartoon, a large dog sitting in a, sitting in a chair before a computer uh, tells the smaller dog who's on the floor that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And it's one of the most reproduced cartoons uh, from The New Yorker. It's also what we now know to be an internet meme. And so in 1993, it was also then that the National Center for Supercomputing Appli Applications, or NCSA, released the first ga um, graphical interface browser. And with this browser, now you could see images at the same time that you saw text. And as a result, the adoption and use of the internet became uh, available to the more, uh, to the general public. Not long after that, other browsers uh, were released that also had these features, such as Netscape and Microsoft's Internet Explorer. It was also in 1995 that an event occurred that really changed the nature of the internet forever, and that was the commercialization of the internet. So at that time, Amazon had uh, been uh, released and proclaimed itself to be Earth's largest bookstore. It was also at this time that Auction Web, now known as eBay, had made its first sale. And it was Matt Frazier who was the first one who had purchased something on this online auction. It was a broken laser pointer. That's him pictured below, and he still has that laser pointer today. So in the mid-1990s, I was a student, doctoral student at the University of Illinois studying group performance in face-to-face -face versus computer-mediated groups. And I later joined the National Center of Supercomputing Applications so we could really understand how the internet would be changing business. And there I am up in the upper right-hand corner, um, a picture that was taken as part of their promotional materials. And so, at this time, also, my first article was published in an academic journal. And in this article, we focused on whether people would, sh what kind of ideas people would share with one another when they were communicating via computers or they were communicating face to face. And the inspiration for this research came from a cool finding in psychology. Um, and that finding was by um, a couple of psychologists, Stasser and Titus. And what they studied were face-to-face -face groups who had varied information. And so in this picture is an example of this, where you can see that the topics or information about topics A, B, and C are common to at least two members in the group. But there's also a unique piece of information, which is labeled D. This unique piece of information is only held by one group member. And so what they found, whoops, what they found was that during the group discussion, people discussed what was common to the group. 
But what they were most interested in looking to and finding out was what would, ha what would this member who had this unique piece of information, what would this member do? Would they share this information with the group and provide something new and different to the discussion? The answer was that no, they didn't communicate this. And so what we wanted to know is what would happen if if communication was occurring online. And so here, would they really be feeling freer to share these unique ideas? And our rationale was that it would free people to share unique ideas. And the reason is, is that when you're talking with other people via computers, the other people in the group tend to fade into the background. You can't see them shake their head or frown if an unpopular idea is shared with the group. And as a result, this frees people to then communicate something new that the group hadn't heard. So they do feel freer, potentially, to make this, um, to contribute this piece of information. And so in order to test this, we um, examined the assignments that students had submitted as part of a psychology class. And within this psychology class, they were broken up in teams of three to four individuals. And they began by writing individual essays each week based on the content from the lecture for that week. They then would meet in teams to write group essays. And they met either to communicate via computers or to communicate and talk and work together in person. We watched what happened over six weeks. And we saw that originally, at the very beginning, in the first three weeks, that there really weren't very many differences between the essays written by those who were communicating via computers and those who were meeting face to face. But in the last three weeks, something interesting happened. And what we found after the last three weeks is that those who were meeting in computer-mediated groups, they began to incorporate more unique ideas into the group essays, whereas those who were meeting face-to-face -face did not. And when we looked to why this might be, it appeared that those people who were communicating via computers were more likely to share their unique perspectives with the group during the discussion, and thus it made its way into their group essays, whereas the face-to-face -face group wasn't doing this. And so we were encouraged by this because we thought, well, as people get more practice and more experience talking via computers, then they should become more comfortable sharing their unique ideas and beliefs with others. And perhaps over time, it would become standard for people to share their unique beliefs and opinions online. And so that brings us to today. And there's certainly a lot of experiences and opportunities for us to communicate with other people on the internet. There is also a lot of practice and more practice that we have that we didn't experience back in the 90s. But at the same time, there's a lot less anonymity nowadays than there was in the past. And indeed, The New Yorker in 2015 published an article in which case the two dogs who appeared in the 1993 cartoon are both sitting on the floor reminiscing and saying, remember when on the internet nobody knew who we were. And so this really captured more of what we might be losing, perhaps some of the anonymity. And so I wondered based on this, whether or not this might cause an opposite effect. So maybe because we're more identifiable now online, that perhaps people won't be as free to share their unique ideas and opinions. But we also wondered what would happen if online this particular unique information that you had or unique belief or opinion was something that would actually help someone else. And what if somebody was actually asking for this unique piece of information? 
And so I expressed this with a colleague of mine, and we began to look at posts that were posted on TripAdvisor, and they were similar to the one that you see here. And in this post, a mother is, has posted a query because she's planning a trip to Seattle. And during this trip to Seattle, she, um, for her son's grad, uh, to celebrate her son's graduation, and during this trip to Seattle, there are certain things they want to see, such as Pike Place and Seattle Center. They also, she also wants to make sure that the hotel is one um, where she's not paying a fortune for it, but she also wants it to be clean. And so there were four responses to her query. This is the first one. So the first respondent has mentioned that they are recommending the West End, and this is based on location. So they suggest that this one is ideal because of this, but you might also choose the Mayflower, also based on location. Here's the second person's response. And here, the second respondent agrees with the first respondent and adds that the Mayflower has rooms that have um, two bathrooms. And here's the third person's response. And here, they're also voting for the West End based on the location. And then continuing on with this theme of location, they also talk about the Holiday Inn and the Hampton Inn being near the Space Needle, while Hotel Vintage is further away from downtown. And then the fourth and final response is posted. And here, the respondent seems to misunderstand the third respondent, saying that the Mayflower has a more vintage feel. But like the earlier respondents, this person also focuses on location and says both hotels are perfect based on this. So we noticed something really curious here, and that was that there seemed to be this general consensus among these respondents to focus on location, especially the proximity to Pike Place. And because of this, they all recommended the Weston or the Mayflower. But let's look again at the mother's hotel criteria. So yes, she did say that she wanted, location was important to her, but she wanted to be, go to the Seattle Center as well as Pike Place. She also mentioned that she didn't want uh, to spend a fortune on the hotel, and also that she wanted it to be clean. And you'll notice that the respondents focused on location, but none of them mentioned anything about price or cleanliness. We examined posts from other forums, and in general, we found the same effect again and again. Respondents relied primarily upon what other respondents were saying and ignored some of what the person who posted the query said was important to them. And we wondered how we might encourage people to share their more unique information with the group if it hadn't been mentioned yet. And we thought, well, what would happen if we made this unique information especially important? So what if this unique attribute, this unique piece of information that you held, was the secret to revealing what would be the best recommendation? And so what we did was we had participants come to the lab and we gave them a, a query, a post um, that we said was posted on a forum that we had created. And in this query, the person said that they would be traveling from out of town with six of their friends. And with their six friends, they wanted to dine at a restaurant um, that had a nice atmosphere but wasn't too loud and was affordably priced. And so in this particular request, there was the critical piece of information, which was that they needed to go to a restaurant that could accommodate a large party. All of the participants were given complete information about both restaurant options that the person posting the query was considering. And within that wealth of information they had about both restaurants was a key piece of information, which was that only one of the restaurants could accommodate a large party. And we wanted to see whether or not someone would bring this up, especially if no one before them had said anything about it. 
And the answer was, we again found they left out this critical piece of information, even though it was the secret to revealing what was the best restaurant for the person um, requesting the information. And so we wondered why this was happening. And it seems like the reason that this happens is because people um, identify the most with other respondents. They get a sense of we-ness. So we with the, uh, me and myself with the other respondents, we are the experts who are giving advice. We're not the ones who are seeking advice. And because they focus on the other respondents rather than the person who posted the question in the first place, they tend to conform with what the other respondents are saying and maybe build a little bit upon what the other respondents are saying, if, even if this means ignoring what the person who posted the question expressed were their, their specific needs. And so we wondered, well, how might we be able to, to actually get them to change their focus and have the person who actually posts the query maybe get more of their attention. And we found that the way to do this was to encourage them to provide accurate information. And if we encourage them to provide accurate information, then what other people said faded more into the background. They weren't trying to conform more with other respondents. Instead, they looked at the person posting the question and looked to what their needs were in terms of giving them the most critical information that would help them make the best decision. So there are other likely reasons why people don't share information that is unique. One reason is due to our need to belong. So because humans are social animals, we're hardwired to want to be included in the group rather than excluded from the group. And as a result, we want to say things that allow us to fit in with others rather than, than say something that potentially could make us stand out and be excluded from the group. A related reason is based on audience feedback. So audience feedback, especially in a social media, is publicly available and often permanently recorded. And so we really want to make sure that we're getting that public validation through number of likes, reshares, and helpfulness votes. And so you might think maybe people aren't sharing unique information for a good reason. Maybe it's unpopular. Maybe you're going to get negative feedback as a result from it. So you might be especially unlikely to go out on a limb and share this information. And then finally, we have a need to see ourselves favorably. So it's not just how other people see us, but also that we want to look at ourselves in the mirror and see ourselves in a positive light. And often what this can mean is that we want to share information that we think other people will accept and like as well. So by needing to belong, and wanting favorable audience feedback and wanting to view ourselves favorably, people often conform and say what is common rather than sharing what is unique information and beliefs. But as more and more people say what is common and what seems to be popular, the pressure to suppress and silence unique information intensifies. And so I encourage you to think about ways we might encourage other people to share their unique perspectives. For instance, we might think about ways that we might um, reduce people's need to belong. For instance, by en encouraging other motivations, such as the motivation and need to provide more accurate information. We might also ask for diverse, different, unique perspectives, and then validate and like those unique and different perspectives when they're expressed. And lastly, we, might make, we want to ensure that those people who express these unique perspectives feel good about themselves after doing so. And so I encourage you that in trying to free other people to share their unique selves, their true beliefs, despite how popular or unpopular they may seem when communicating online, that you consider applying these factors um, in order to do so. Thank you. <laughs>